You are Locked On Kings, your daily Sacramento Kings podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is that time. Time for another episode of Locked On Kings. Will the Kings win it? Or will we go to a third overtime? Inbounds to Powell. Left wing. Up fake. Kicks it out to Batum. Launches for three. Misses it. Rebound loose. Kings grab it. Malik Monk has it. And Sacramento from 14 down late in regulation has come back in double overtime to win one of the most memorable games in their 38-year history in Sacramento. 176-175 is the final score. You talk about making a statement. You talk about proving that you're worthy of title contention. What a victory this is for the Sacramento Kings. Let's go! Come on now! Put some respect on the Sacramento Kings. This is a playoff team. This team takes haymaker after a haymaker that Kawhi Leonard, who looked like an MVP tonight, and the Los Angeles Clippers, who shot 60% from the field and nearly 60% from three-point range, they take blow after blow, and they survive and win on the road in Los Angeles. This is a playoff team in Sacramento. You deserve to be fired up, Sacramento Kings fans. And if you're a Clippers fan or if you're a fan of any other team or NBA basketball Welcome to the Locked On Kings podcast. You deserve to be here, and damn it, it's about time you pay attention to what the Sacramento freaking Kings are doing. This win is so important to the city of Sacramento. Let me make that perfectly clear off the jump, and we're throwing everything out the window. By the way, uh, that was uh, the G-Man Gary Gerald's call on the Kings radio broadcast. That footage via uh, Jason Anderson of the Sacramento Bee, who was in Crypto.com Arena or whatever the hell it's called, uh, to watch tonight's absolute insane uh, history-making game between the Kings and the Los Angeles Clippers. So thank you to them for allowing us to use this. We're throwing our normal uh, format out, and I'm just going to spew because i got to release all this. I've waited 45 minutes to release all this. I had to do a broadcast on ABC 10 where I could only let out a little bit of this. But now here on Locked on Kings, I'm letting it all out. And let me make one thing perfectly clear to you how important this game is for Sacramento. I'm not talking about the Kings. I'm not talking about the organization. I'm not talking about De'Aaron Fox and Malik Monk. I'm talking about Sacramento. I'm talking about a fan base who has suffered for 16 years, who has begged for a team to give them the same feelings and the same joy and the same excitement that they experienced back in the late 90s and early 2000s. And if you look at how that magical run got started, you'll see parallels to what this Kings team is doing this year. This team is special. The beam is not a gimmick. It is a lifestyle. It is a representation of what the Sacramento Kings are finally doing. It is a representation of the hope of Sacramento Kings fans and the payoff of years of suffering and continue to support a team that damn near left them and went to another city. The Kings fans stayed. This win is for them. This win is about them. And as much as we're going to give credit to De'Aaron Fox and to Malik Monk and to Mike Brown and this entire Kings team and this front office for finally breaking the playoff uh, drought. And I'm, I'm telling you, it's done. They're breaking the playoff drought. This is a playoff team. Anybody who still disrespects or undermines what the Sacramento Kings are doing at this point, you don't have a leg to stand on. You don't have a foundation. Everything you say is a moot point. And I don't care mathematically. There's still plenty of time for the Kings to fall out of the playoffs. Watch this Sacramento Kings team. Watch what they did tonight against the Los Angeles Clippers. And tell me, this team is going to fall apart. Tell me, this team doesn't belong in the playoff conversation. They earn the respect of the Los Angeles Clippers tonight if they didn't have it already. And any doubter who says they still don't respect the Sacramento Kings, you are lying to yourself. This team deserves the respect and the recognition that they have earned before tonight. But tonight is the cherry on top of the Sunday that is this Kings team being a playoff team. They're in the third seed, not because it's a fluke. They're in the third seed because they've played like the third best team in the Western Conference 
and maybe even the second best team in the Western Conference with how much the Memphis Grizzlies are struggling to this point. I have no idea if this audio is any good or not, to be honest with you. I have no clue. I might have blown out the microphone with my introduction. So hopefully everything's good. I'm already dripping in sweat already. But you know what? This is a time to celebrate. And there's professional Matt, right? And then there's Locked On Kings Matt. And Locked On Kings Matt is letting it all out because I stand and I'm proud of my background as a Sacramento Kings fan. I grew up as a child of the late 90s and early 2000s. I was spoiled by the greatest show on court. Well, the greatest show on court and the beam team are what Sacramento can finally rest their hats on. And hopefully, the beam team will get to a point where they are on equal footing with the greatest show on court, where they are a championship contender. Because if this is how good the Kings are now, with clear holes, clear uh, deficiencies, especially on the defensive end, without the playoff experience that we're so desperate to get this team to have, if this is how good they are now without that experience, imagine how good they're going to be with that experience. I've been telling you for years here on Locked on Kings, once De'Aaron Fox gets the stage that John Morant and some of the other uh, anointed, exciting young guards and future guards of the NBA, what they have gotten and where they have shined, once De'Aaron gets that stage, he will be on the same level, if not above those guards. He will be considered and recognized the same way that they are. And he's not even waiting for the playoff stage. He's demanding that recognition with how he played tonight. And he and his Kentucky partner, Malik Monk, were absolutely insane tonight. We're, of course, going to get into that. But recognize how important this game and this win is for the city of Sacramento. Recognize, of course, how important, uh, important this win is for the Sacramento Kings and their playoff race right now. Like, second night of a back-to-back, -back, taking on a fresh and reinforced with Russell Westbrook and, and Plumlee and all the other additions that they made, a reinforced Clippers team that did not play last night on their home floor, throwing haymaker after haymaker after haymaker at the Sacramento Kings, getting the Kings to drop down by double digits multiple times in this game, including with three minutes left in the fourth quarter. Kings were down 11 points with three minutes left in the fourth quarter. How do they respond? Fox bucket, Fox steal, Fox bucket, Keegan Murray steal, Keegan Murray bucket, all setting up Malik Monk's uh, buzzer, or nearly buzzer beater three in the fourth quarter that set this game to overtime. The Sacramento Kings have not lost a game in overtime this season. They're 4-0 and in overtime. And I'm, if I'm not mistaken, a majority of those games, I think three of the four of them, have been on the road. This team is different. This team has earned your recognition. This team, if nothing else, has earned your attention. And there's only one entity to be mad at tonight, and that's the NBA. Shame on you, NBA. Shame on you for putting the Sacramento Kings on national TV once. And I don't care that a lot of these national TV games are decided at the beginning of the season, before we knew the Kings were going to be this, right? I don't care about that because you just flexed the Los Angeles Lakers back down our throats in another national TV game. So now they have 70-something of them. Not really, that's an exaggeration, but they have far too many for a team that is not only not in the playoff picture, they're not in the play-in picture at this point. You'll flex them onto their TVs because they're from L.A. and LeBron James is on that team, even though there's no reason to watch at this point because LeBron already broke the scoring record. Meanwhile, you'll only put the Sacramento Kings on national TV once, and what did they do in that national TV game? They beat the living you-know-what out of the Brooklyn Nets and put up 150 points. And then you have the Kings versus the Clippers. You have the fourth-place Clippers versus the third-place Kings. Kawhi Leonard is back. Reinforced Clippers. Most exciting offense in the NBA and the Sacramento Kings. You have that game on your lap. And what game did you pick tonight? You have the Phoenix Suns without Kevin Durant and the Oklahoma City Thunder. Two fine teams. But you dropped the ball, NBA. You dropped the ball by not having this game. You did a disservice to your audience by not having this game on national TV for everybody to enjoy. And you did a disservice to yourselves by not finding a way to put the Sacramento Kings somewhere on national TV during this historic playoff race for them. Shame on you, NBA. But you know what? We're not going to focus on the negative. We're going to focus on the positive. Put some damn respect on the Sacramento Kings tonight. Recognize that they belong in this playoff picture. 176 to 175, the final score. Kings beat the Clippers on the road in double overtime. The second highest scoring game in NBA history. And the Kings shattered their former points in a game record of 164 tonight. Shattered it. Double overtime, 
176 to 175. That is a real final score. And you know what? Even if the Sacramento Kings had lost this game, and there were many points where they were down by four in both overtime periods, where they could have folded and could have lost this game. I already mentioned them being down by 11 points with three minutes remaining. Like, many opportunities for the Kings to lose this game, especially on the second out of a back-to-back. And trust me, this team was gassed. See how tired De'Aaron Fox was out there? And he continued to fight through it. Many points where the Kings could have folded and they didn't. But even if they had, even if they had lost this game, even if the inexperience had caught up to them, even if they couldn't withstand the LA Clippers shooting just unbelievable uh, percentages from around the floor, even if they couldn't overcome Kawhi Leonard looking like the Raptors championship Kawhi Leonard, the MVP Kawhi Leonard, I still would have been beyond proud of this team. Beyond proud. Because they have earned the respect of everybody. Everybody in the NBA. 100% have earned that respect. No more, oh, it's the Kings. They're going to fall apart at some point. No. At this point, if the Kings fall apart, you should be surprised by that. Not, oh, same old Kings. That's what I expected to happen. Wrong. At this point, from this point on, the expectation is that the Sacramento Kings are a playoff team. The expectation is that the Sacramento Kings are a top seed in the West. And until they prove us otherwise, that's how they should be recognized. This this game, this win, how they battled back time after time, went toe-to-toe with a championship contender, a team that so many people in the West think actually is going to come out of the West and make the NBA Finals and maybe win the whole damn thing. The Kings went toe-to-toe with that team, went down on the road multiple times, continued to come back, and continued to win. Sacramento has a target on their back. Mike Brown has talked about it a lot. They are the hunted in the Western Conference, and I've made this perfectly clear talking about it on Locked on Kings. The Sacramento Kings are the least experienced team in this playoff race, which makes them the hunted, the most hunted out of every single team in the West. Maybe they're not anymore based off of how this game went. But this team showed me that they are not afraid at all of their target. This team showed me that De'Aaron Fox, who's never been on this big of a stage before, has, was born for this stage and has been ready for this stage for years and is not going to shy away from it. Malik Monk is not going to shy away from it. And it's not just the two of them. Like so many big shots, so many big moments from different players. I'm going to go through this box score and go through this Kings performance here in just a little bit. But this team has never been here before. They've been together less than a calendar year. And they're going up against a proven core of Kawhi Leonard and Paul George with Ty Lue at the helm and a Clippers group that, granted, they have some new pieces, including their starting point guard and Russell Westbrook, right? Have some new pieces, but they've been together. They've been there before. They have championship experience that the Sacramento Kings outside of Harrison Barnes and Matthew Della Vadova do not have. And yet, the Kings not only went toe-to-toe tonight, they didn't just steal this win. They were the better team. They overcame. I don't know if the Clippers are going to be able to shoot better than this ever. And still the Kings beat them. Still the Kings beat them. And do not be fooled by this final score. And I saw a lot of people, national media members, who weren't watching the game up until the end, which is fine, I understand, but they weren't watching, tweeting out, man, are the, are the Sacramento Kings, are the Los Angeles Lakers going to play defense at some point? I'm telling you, this goes beyond just bad defense on both sides. This was a showcase of shot making like we really have never seen before and may never see again. Like, the shot making in this game by the LA Clippers was beyond phenomenal 60 percent from the field 59 of 98 57 percent from three-point range 26 of 45 plus 86 percent at the line 31 of 36 that we that's insane and those aren't just them making they didn't make 30 uh, or rather 26 wide open three-pointers a majority of these shots were contested the clippers weren't missing and yet Sacramento continued to hang around and hang around. And when the Clippers would create separation, the Kings would find a way to battle back. The Kings shooting percentages were not as great, but were still very solid. And one thing that I've been really encouraged by is these first two games after the All-Star break, the Sacramento Kings in both those games have shot over 40% from three-point range, which is something that they've been struggling with as a team for the last three, four weeks or so. So the jump shots apparently seem to be back in these offense, which is 
the top in the NBA, one of the best offenses in NBA history statistically, this offense has shown that they can overcome 175 points put against them. They can overcome a 60-57-86 shooting performance from a championship contender. Now, I wouldn't suggest the Sacramento Kings rely on 176 points every single night, but this offense is good enough to where even those defensive inefficiencies, even when that defense really shows its ugly side of its, uh, its, its, its ugly face, right? Show, rears its ugly head. The Kings offense can carry them through that. Plus, the Kings had major defensive positive moments in crucial points during this game. I still have so much to get to. I haven't even talked about the numbers that Malik Monk and De'Aaron Fox put up yet. I have to get to that. I have to talk about the physicality that the Kings face, DeMontis a bonus, getting into foul trouble. Want to share some love for the Sacramento Kings broadcast team who just did a phenomenal job. We have more to get to. I have no idea how much time I've already taken. I'm blowing again our format completely out of the water. I have no idea how long I'm going to go tonight. I have no idea if I'm going to have a voice left over. And I don't want to just hear myself talk. Kings fans, get loose in the comment section on YouTube. Get loose on Twitter, at Matt George Sack. Tag me, tweet me, DM me. Email me, mattgeorgesports at gmail.com. Let's talk, let's celebrate, let's enjoy this moment. Because yeah, there's still 23 more games to go. There's still a lot of race left and a lot of tension left. But if, I mean, there's been so many games already that you can hang your hat on that says this Kings team is legit. There is no game more significant than this one tonight. This game should be able to carry your doubts and your doom and gloom, or should be able to carry you through all those doubts and all those dark clouds and doom and gloom and all those fears for the remainder of this season. This is who the Sacramento Kings are. Yeah, it's a once-in-a-lifetime game. Yeah, it's a once-in-a-lifetime performance. But the foundation of why the Kings were able to put that performance together is something that they've done time after time after time this season. Today's episode of the Locked On Kings podcast is brought to you by our friends at FanDuel, the official sportsbook partner of the Locked On Podcast Network. And if you're new to FanDuel, this is the perfect time for you. They have something called a no-sweat first bet for you to try out. When you play on FanDuel and you make your first wager, you can make it with full confidence because if you lose, you can win up to $1,000 of free bonus bets back if your first bet does not win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores uh, and to even threes drained. Hopefully you took the over on threes drained for the Clippers or threes drained. Maybe you took the over on points tonight for the Kings and Clippers. That's the right decision. You should really take the over on points every time the Sacramento Kings play at this point. Plus, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a same-game parlay. Don't miss the chance to get your no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, the official sports betting, or rather an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Yesterday on the Locked On Kings podcast, I posed a question at the end of the podcast after the Kings win uh, at home, a game that got off to a really, really rocky start against the Portland Trailblazers. At the, in the very last segment, I asked the question, I said, outside of De'Aaron Fox and DeMontis Sabonis, who are the most important Kings for this playoff race? And I got a lot of good responses. I shared with you that my answer was Malik Monk. Well, I'm not here to say I told you so because I damn well, I, I sure as hell did not predict Malik Monk to have the game that he had tonight. But 45 points, 15 of 24 shooting, 6 of 12 from three-point range, 9 of 10 from the free throw line, 6 assists for Malik Monk off the bench tonight in 40 minutes and 38 seconds. Malik Monk is just incredible. Like, this is a special performance. This goes beyond, like, it's not just the big threes that he was hitting. Like, he had so many amazing dunks. He had that awesome Lob City-esque uh, alley-oop connection with his Kentucky teammate, De'Aaron Fox. I think that was in the third quarter when the Kings were trying to put together a run and come back from a deficit that they were facing uh, at that point in time. Like, his performance was beyond special. Plus, he had a couple dunks. He had a transition dunk in the in the first overtime period when the Kings were down four, he just went coast to coast and dunked it between two Clippers like it was easy. Like he didn't even have to think about it. Like Malik Monk was absolutely special tonight. Now we've called him a microwave scorer and we've been waiting for that explosion. We've seen Malik Monk explode at different times this season. 
especially with his assists and, and with moving the ball and getting his teammates involved, right? And he had elements of that tonight. But this is the offensive, explosive version of Malik Monk that somehow the Los Angeles Clippers allowed to, uh, rather Lakers, allowed to walk and the Sacramento Kings scooped up. And it's, a, it's, it's so wonderful that the Sacramento Kings did make that decision to scoop him up. And I've seen the comments on YouTube. I've seen the comments uh, on Twitter saying, start Malik Monk. He needs to start. He's better than Kevin Herter. That might be the case. He certainly was better than Kevin Herter tonight. Malik Monk's role is perfect. And I know I've touched on this before on Locked on Kings. Malik Monk is in the perfect role for the Sacramento Kings. That is why Mike Brown continues to keep him there. That's why in games where Kevin Herter is out with injury, Malik Monk is still coming off the bench because of how essential he is for that second unit. The energy that Malik brings, the swagger that he brings, the lightheartedness that he brings to that Kings locker room, but the business side of Malik Monk that he showed, the scowl, the nastiness that he showed tonight in Los Angeles. The Kings don't have a chance in this game without that emotional element that Malik Monk brings to this team. That swagger, that attitude that he brings to a team that has not been in this position before, but they play like they do. They played tonight like it was game seven of an NBA playoff series, and they were the favorite. And you know what? I'm pissed that the Los Angeles, uh, I know there are Kings fans down in, in Crypto Arena. I'm pissed that Los Angeles got this game. Can you imagine? Can you imagine how the Golden One Center would have been tonight? Like, that building would not be standing. If, if the Sacramento Kings and Los Angeles Clippers had played that game, 176 to 175, inside the Golden One Center, that building would be in ruins. That place would have been insane. And I'm not saying that it wasn't loud at Crypto.com Arena and that wasn't a great atmosphere. Because I could tell through my television it was popping in there. Kings fans and Clippers fans enjoying history being made in front of them. Enjoying, in my opinion, the greatest NBA regular season game ever played. Good on them. I'm not saying they didn't deserve it. I'm just saying... That game in Sacramento, NBA wouldn't have been able to recover from that. And how do we pay attention to basketball tomorrow? Thank God the Sacramento Kings don't play tomorrow. We need to, we need to decompress. We need, we need a break after that performance that they put, uh, put together and that roller coaster that they just put us through. Plus, they, they deserve to sleep until like 10 or 11 a.m. tomorrow morning just to recoup from the emotions and the energy exerted in that game. But had this game been in Sacramento, man, I, I, the city would be in just in complete shambles in the best way possible. Malik Monk, of course, would have been a major part of that. Malik Monk is not only an energizer bunny for the Sacramento Kings team, he's an energizer bunny for the fans. And then, of course, there's De'Aaron Fox. I mean, I don't know if there's anything more that I could say about Fox that I haven't already said at some point or another this season here on Locked on Kings. If you didn't think he deserved to be an all-star, I don't, I don't know what the hell you're watching. You don't know basketball. Sorry. If... I mean, if you thought that him being a, a all-star um, replacement was appropriate, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm sorry. I don't care who's in the Western Conference. De'Aaron Fox cannot be denied. He continues to prove he cannot be denied. 42 points, 17 of 27 from the field, 2 of 4 from three-point range, 6 of 11 from the free-throw line, 12 assists, 5 rebounds, 5 steals. Fox's defense in the clutch, like we know how good of a clutch score he is, right? Leads the NBA in clutch points. Like he's just clutch beyond clutch, beyond clutch, beyond clutch, right? But defensively, how clutch he was in this game, creating turnovers, creating opportunity for his teammates. He did more in the clutch defensively and assisting than he did scoring tonight. That is massive when you can get that out of your best player. And De'Aaron Fox had to step up in a major way, too, with DeMontis Sabonis being in so much foul trouble. Now, this is going to be something. Uh, DeMontis Sabonis has now fouled out seven times this season. That leads the NBA. He also leads the NBA in personal fouls. DeMontis Sabonis is going to face this every single night for the remainder of this season and is going to face this every single night in the playoffs. Teams are going to try and get him into foul trouble because that's the only way, really, you can stop him. You have to get DeMontis Sabonis into foul trouble. And... Sabonis needs to find out how to avoid foul trouble as much as possible and not put him into positions where the fouls can get him into that trouble. But the Sacramento Kings, like they did tonight, also need to find a way to overcome that. A big reason for them overcoming that was a combined 87 points 
from De'Aaron Fox and Malik Monk, right? You can't necessarily rely on that every single night. And I give credit to DeMontis Sabonis. He didn't pick up that sixth foul until, was it the second overtime period? It might have been the first overtime period. But he picked up his fifth foul in the third quarter in a, with a horrible call, by the way, just a dreadful call where he was called for an illegal screen when he didn't even screen the ball handlers, man. He was not necessarily tangled up, but he was grabbing and having and being grabbed on by whoever was guarding him. I don't remember who it was. And he was trying to move out of the way of the ball handler, trying to move out of the play to give the ball handler a lane. Now, if you want to say that he grabs and takes his defender with him, okay, if you want to make that argument, even though he's being grabbed, okay, fine, I'll listen to that argument. Except that's what Draymond Green does every freaking night. Draymond Green's been allowed to do that for years in Golden State. He does it 20 times a game. We see it time after time. We saw it during the NBA Finals. He never gets called for that. So why, in a play that didn't result in points, in a play where the guard wasn't even attacking yet, he was just simply trying to move on the perimeter, and DeMontis Sabonis is trying to move out of the way and take his man and move out of the way, why is that a foul on DeMontis Sabonis when it's not a foul on Draymond Green? Oh yeah, Draymond Green is a big, important Defensive Player of the Year candidate on an NBA championship team. Maybe not this year, but in years past, right? Preferential treatment. Tony Brothers, man. Tony, I'm sure you're a great guy. Actually, I don't know. You might be terrible. Sometimes you're terrible at your job. A lot of Kings fans will say uh, all the time, you're terrible at your job. Here's what I'll say about the officiating. It was bad. There were times it was bad, bad, bad for both sides, but particularly on the Kings side. But here's what's most important. Here's the point that I want to hammer home about the officiating. The Kings didn't allow it to stop them. The Kings played through it. I won't say they ignored it because they were certainly talking and jawing when they needed to. Mike Brown picked up a technical foul defending DeMontis Sabonis after he picked up that fifth foul, which, if I'm not mistaken, I think Mike Brown challenged that illegal screen call and it was upheld, which is just ridiculous. But anyway, the Kings did not allow it to affect them. They played through it. They battled through it. They, there are times I'm sure the Kings felt like they were playing five on eight. Now, I try to avoid talking about the referees as much as possible. Sometimes that's been unavoidable this season with the last two-minute report and how the Kings have literally been on the wrong side of the last two-minute report more than any other team this season. And that's a, that was a study done. I can't remember who did it, but they broke it down looking at all the last two-minute reports. I'm telling you, the Kings are the, uh, have, have, have had the calls go against them more than any other team in the league. And yet still, here they are, third in the Western Conference, and here they are tonight overcoming that and defeating the Los Angeles Clippers on the road. That is what I put my weight into. The Kings did not give in to the frustrations of the referees. They did not give in to the multiple haymakers that the Los Angeles Clippers threw at them. They persevered, they overcame, and they won the greatest regular season game in NBA history. Really quickly, before we go, shout out to the Sacramento Kings broadcast team, in particular Mark Jones and Katie Christensen, who called like I said, in my opinion, the greatest regular season NBA game in history. And they did a just a masterful job at calling this game. Perfection, nearly. They had fun. They managed to communicate the excitement and the significance of the moment. Of course, they told the story of the Sacramento Kings' perseverance, not just in this game, but throughout this season. And when they needed to, they got out of the way. And that's the sign of a really good broadcaster, when they can let a moment breathe on its own and let a moment stand for itself. I didn't get the opportunity to hear G-Man, Gary Gerald's full radio call, but G-Man, let me tell you, I love Katie. I love Mark. Like, Katie's a friend of mine. Katie was on the podcast not too long ago. I worked with Katie for, for a couple of years. Uh, she's, I think she's excellent. Some people don't. That's fine. Your own cup of tea. Same. I know a lot of people love Mark Jones. I know a lot of people don't like Mark Jones. That's fine. Your cup of tea. Uh, you can't not like the G-Man. And I'm going to go home and listen to this entire game just to hear G-Man's call of it. And there is nobody, maybe outside of Jerry Reynolds, there is nobody on this earth that deserves this more than Gary Gerald. That includes the Sacramento, entire Sacramento Kings fan base. Nobody has sat through more losing basketball than G-Man has. So for him to get moments to call this, to, to do what he loves, he's coming up on his 3,000th career game calling Kings basketball. That's incredible. He deserves this so much. So I'm sure, uh, I mean, you heard his call at the beginning. 
uh, of, of the podcast. He was phenomenal. His call was amazing. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I honestly get a little emotional like thinking about it, like what he gets and, and what Katie gets because Katie's been here a long time too. Mark, not so much, but still Mark does a, a phenomenal job. Like this fan base, the media, a lot of our media members have, have covered this team with how bad they've been for so long. Like this is this is special for all of us. This is truly special for all of us. Even uh, us media members who don't consider ourselves fans that just cover the basketball team and are tired of covering losing basketball, right? This is special for all of us. Tonight is a night that I will always remember. And it's a win during the regular season. It's win for it's win number 34 for the Sacramento Kings this season. 34. That number is not going to mean anything to most people. But this is a night that Sacramento Kings fans, I'm telling you, will remember for a long time. And when we are talking about hopefully a championship team one day here in Sacramento, featuring De'Aaron Fox and DeMontis Sabonis at their core, and hopefully with Malik Monk and Kevin Herter and and some of these other pieces that we've we've fallen in love with this year, the beam team. When the beam is shining uh, and and glowing off of a, uh, a, a championship trophy, hopefully, hopefully we can think back to tonight's game and go, this was an incredibly important step on the road to that title. I'm out of breath. (laughs) I'm drained. I needed this podcast to let all this out because I don't know how the hell I'm going to sleep tonight. Uh, And I I hope my wife and my son can put up with me tossing and turning while I'm trying to to get my bearings. Again, thank God we have a day off tomorrow. (laughs) Thank God to decompress. Uh, and to uh, soak all this in. This was special. And this is a game that uh, I think we're going to be talking about for a very, very long time. Thank you for choosing Locked on Kings. Thank you for listening to Locked on Kings. Thank you for being a part of this community for us to celebrate a win like this together. I'm looking forward to continuing on this playoff race and into the, excuse me, into the playoffs with you here on Locked on Kings. This is so fun. This is just so much fun. And I want to remember nights like this, and I want to never take nights like this and a season like this for granted, because it's been a long time coming. So let's just enjoy it. Just soak it all and enjoy it. Kings beat the Clippers in a double overtime classic, 176 to 175. My name is Matt George. Until next time, you have been listening to Locked On Kings, part of the Locked On Podcast Network.